The last few days have been pretty great for the PC gaming community, from AMD's new Ryzen CPUs to their Navi GPUs, and even Nvidia's new Super cards as well. If you saw my video on Sunday about the new Ryzen CPUs, you'll know that the end kind of mentioned a bit of a spanner in the works, and that is potentially these X570 motherboards. Now since this video is all about this Gigabyte board, and they provided quite a lot of information on why they're so expensive, I thought I would explain, well, why they're so expensive compared to last gen or even the Intel counterparts. The first reason is the PCIe Gen 4 support. They've had to use significantly higher quality PCBs to allow for the signals to actually transfer properly, and they've also generally had to use uh, more layer PCBs. So this uh, master board has a six layer PCB and their extreme board uses eight. The second reason is also power delivery. We're looking at a platform where you can put a 16 core monster of a CPU in the same socket as a quad core APU, and so you need some pretty beefy power delivery, at least on the high and boards like this one. This board uses Infineon controllers, they also have a 14 phase design with 50 amp MOSFETs to go with it. In the real world that means that the 3900X that's in here currently basically doesn't make this thing sweat at all. The VRMs were looking at about 50 degrees Celsius under full 100% load with the 12 core and even in terms of surface temperatures of the heatsink itself you're looking at about 40 degrees so really not pushing this at all. Alright so now you know why it's expensive, let's take a look at what else it can do. The first thing is the three M.2 slots. All of these are Gen 4 connections with heat sinks on top, and the top one goes directly to your CPU, which means it can support these rather awesome and very beefy Gen 4 SSDs, like this one from uh, Gigabyte themselves, or also the new one from Corsair as well. Now the bottom two slots go through the chipset, but since the chipset now has a Gen 4 connection, that's equivalent to an ATX Gen 3 connection, and so that would mean if you were to put, say, a Gen 4 SSD in the top slot going straight to the CPU, CPU and two Gen 3 SSDs, so Samsung 970 EVO Plus or whatever else, uh, in those two bottom slots, you actually wouldn't be bottlenecking any of your SSDs there. Now the chipset does have a fan under its heatsink, so do bear that in mind, but my experience with it is that it barely turned on, and when it did turn on, it was no louder than the graphics card that almost always sits on top of it, and so you really don't hear it at all. Now since we're talking about PCIe connectivity, I should mention the actual PCIe slots you get. You get three X16 sized and reinforced slots, although only the top one is X16 you know, electrically, whereas the middle is an X8 electrically and the bottom one is an X4. You also have one surprise header here, and that is a Thunderbolt header. Now, for those that don't know, Thunderbolt is an Intel technology that's mostly been secluded to high-end and Apple devices, but is now being rolled into the next generation of USB, and so in theory this is a future-proofing move so that when we do get the new version of USB, you should be able to go straight away and use it with this board. As you'd expect in 2019, we have plenty of RGB headers, two addressables and two sort of standard ones. We also have seven PWM four pin fan headers, and you also have a USB 3.1 Gen 2 front panel header and two USB 3 front panel headers down the bottom too. In terms of rear IO, on the back you have AC Wi-Fi. It's actually the new Wi-Fi 6, which is great to see. We have a total of 10 USB ports, one of which is type C, and three others are USB 3.1 Gen 2. We also have Gigabit Ethernet with an Intel controller and 2.5 Gigabit Ethernet with a Realtek controller, which is a bit strange to see. We would normally see 10 gig here, but either way, it's nice to have. And we have 7.1 audio with SPDIF. BIOS-wise, it's a bit of a change from Gigabyte's usual affair. They've gone with an easy mode option where you have the ability to change your boot priority, set XMP profiles and see temperatures and stuff like that. And then when you press F2, you get to their more standard BIOS options, which include everything like overclock. And speaking of overclocking, neither of the chips that I have here basically overclock at all past their boost clocks, and so I can't really test this out too much, but bearing in mind the amount of headroom that this board clearly has, even with the 12 core kind of overvolted, uh, you really don't see the, the VRMs being stressed here, and so I expect that even if you got a golden sample 16 core that overclocked well, you would still be plenty fine with this board. So should you buy one of these? Well, it's a pretty reliable and pretty impressive in terms of its power delivery capabilities board, but it's near £400 price tag, definitely makes it a bit of a hard product to 
this out. If you compare it to other HEDT, think Threadripper or Intel X289 motherboards, then it definitely has some comparable features, including the ability to run 16 core CPUs in it, but obviously it doesn't have as much RAM support and sometimes a bit less IO as well, and so it's kind of up to you there, but when you compare it to the more standard Intel Z290 boards, for example, uh, it's a good 100 to 150 pounds more expensive than that. If you're on a budget, then this board is definitely not for you. I would recommend checking out some cheaper and generally better options for your price range first before ever looking at this thing, but if you want a high power and therefore high price board that can handle any chip you throw at it from the Zen 2 product stack, then this is definitely an interesting shout. Would I put one in my rig? Well, I'm already using the Gaming 7 Wi-Fi, and so in theory I could just uh, update the BIOS and I would be able to use the new chips, but if I was buying a 16 or even the 12 core myself, then it would actually be fairly high up my list. Now with that said, those are my thoughts. I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the board? Do you think it's too high priced or do you like the feature set and compare it more to HEDT instead? All of that stuff in the comments down below. And of course, if you want to pick up one of these boards, I'll leave a link to it in the description down below. Do bear in mind that the boards and everything that uh, Ryzen and Navi really Related, has only just launched and so it might not be necessarily available right as you click the link but in future that should be the place to go. And of course if you want to see any more videos on X570 motherboards, AMD's Ryzen CPUs, Navi GPUs or Nvidia's RTX Supers make sure you subscribe to the bell notification icon enabled. Uh, I post videos every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 8pm UK time so if you're interested make sure you do that. When the videos pop up you can check out more videos from the X570 motherboards and Ryzen's that are already up and you can take a look at those, and otherwise, if you want to check out the links in the description down below, feel free to do so. There's Amazon and Overclock UK affiliate links, which don't cost you anything to use, but massively help me out when you do use them. There's also merch if you want to pick up hoodies or t-shirts, not like this one. Or you can check out Patreon if you want to get cool rewards and support the channel directly. There's also private internet access, which is a great and cheap VPN, a humble bundle that supports charities while getting cheap games too. Otherwise, that is pretty much it. As I said, if you've got any questions, leave those in the comments down below, and we'll see you all in the next video.